thanks for uh, thanks for having me, everybody. Um, so I guess first I'll give you just a little bit of background about my company, and and uh, and then I'll talk about some of the you know bigger trends, some of the bigger well-known acquisitions in the space, and then uh, talk a little bit about kind of the the digital revolution happening in ag and how that affects things going forward. Um, and look, if you do have questions, uh, feel free to shout them out. Um, pretty casual in that regard uh, and and so I guess first of all um, I, I did graduate from OSU with an Ag Econ degree in 1999 and uh, immediately went to work for SST Software which is a company that my father founded in 1994 um, he was a farmer and then a, a eventually a professor at OSU and was one of the leading innovators in the precision ag technology space and SST uh, was one of the leading precision ag uh, software solutions in the global market and our core customer base is agronomy companies it's CropQuest and Servitech but it's mostly ag retail type companies uh, P&K is a customer other deer dealerships and, and really anybody that's uh, providing services to the grower in the precision ag arena uh, we were acquired by ProAgrica in February of 2018. And uh, just because I haven't touched a piece of chalk in 30 years, I'm going to pick this up. So SST um, acquired by ProAgrica. All right, that's the new name of the company. But it's actually, this is a division of a company that's a publicly traded company, RELX, Relics Group out of London. It's a 47 billion market cap company, does 10 billion in revenue, um, pretty much all in data and analytics. The, they used to be called Reed Elsevier, and for you academics, um, you know, of Elsevier journals, uh, that's one of the uh, components to the company. Um, and then the LX is for LexisNexis, which was one of the flagship acquisitions of the company and is big in the um, insurance and legal market. So Relics is a company that has transitioned from being a publishing company to one where they've been selling off magazines and journals and buying data and software businesses in, in different industries. Proagrica is the agricultural division of that and it's made up of, of several uh, other acquisitions of small software firms. If I have time I'll get into more of that in detail. But So as Dr. Norwood said and as you know um, you know, agriculture, when you look across all the segments, almost every component of ag is now largely controlled by just three or four companies. If you look at the grain market, it's the, we call ABCD companies, ADM, Bungie, Cargill, and Louis Dreyfus control like 90% of the grain business. Uh, in the meat market, you've got JBS out of Brazil, Tyson, Smithfield, they control, you know, 60, 70% of the meat market. Um, and the, the, you know, the more recent acquisitions one have been getting a lot of attention are the, it's the consolidation of the seed and, and chemical players. So there's been massive consolidation for you know, decades in the space. I mean, Monsanto rolled up, I don't know, 40 seed companies or something through the, the 90s and 2000s to become the biggest seed company in the world. Um, and for a long time, we had what we called the big six, which is Monsanto, Bayer, Dow, DuPont, um, Syngenta, and BASF. All right. There's been a, a recent round of mergers over the last few years that have consolidated that group down to really the, the big three plus BASF. So you've got uh, Kim China bought Syngenta, Dow and DuPont merged and created a new company called Corteva, Monsanto was acquired by Bayer and they dropped the Monsanto name, um, which was smart. <laughs> Should have done that a long time ago. Um, and then they, they, Bayer had to sell off some assets to BASF, which bolstered them. Um, and, but they're kind of a distant fourth place at this point. And, you know, a lot of those acquisitions and mergers were driven by the, the kinds of, you know, economic principles we've been, been learning about. Um, that, you know, especially in a, in a market where you've got... Um, an economic downturn that ag's been in for quite a while, you know, there's pressure to grow. 
And there's all those things that were mentioned. I mean, there's, you know, I'm sure a lot of it's compensation at the corporate, you know, at the executive level for some of them and all of that. But those companies, you know, all companies are pressured to grow all the time. And um, one thing that made this susceptible to happen is that all of them were pretty much concentrated in either seed or crop protection and very little of, of them doing both, right? Um, so you had Dow and DuPont come together. DuPont, who owns Pioneer Seed, was 70% of their business was seed. On the Dow side, 80% of it was crop protection. So it made sense for them to bring that together. Um, there's a lot of efficiencies gained by doing that. It gives them access to each other's channels. It lets them package the technology offerings to take to market, to have more leverage on distribution and so on. Um, and then that puts Monsanto and Bayer in a position where they then came together, where you got Monsanto highly concentrated on the seed business and um, Bayer doing very little in seed and number two in the, the chemical space. Uh, those guys came together to, to kind of rival what had happened with Dow DuPont. Um, and then Kim China acquired Syngenta. And that one's a little different because Kim China is a Chinese state-owned chemical company, biggest one in China. Um, I think a lot of the motivation there is that China has 20% of the population of the world. They only have 7% of the arable land. And so they were at the mercy of, you know, Western technology companies developing seeds and traits and chemicals and everything. And they wanted to take some control over that for their own food security reasons. Um, but hey, from a Syngenta perspective, that's also pretty exciting because now they have access to the Chinese market in a way nobody else does. Um, and I think you'll see they'll start rolling up a bunch of the seed companies and chemical companies that are in the Chinese market. There's consolidation at all levels, right? So you go down a level from those guys where you've got the ag retail company. There's a lot of consolidation that's happened there. Um, out of you know hundreds of companies that sell seed, chemical, and fertilizer to farmers, seven of them control like 60% of the market. And Nutrien alone, who is kind of a new name, it's owned by Agrium, used to be CPS, UAP, all these, it, they rolled a lot of stuff up under that, but Nutrien um, is, is doing, I don't know, probably 15, 20% of ag retail business just themselves. Um, they're three times bigger than, than Helena, who's number two. And then in the equipment input market, again, a lot of consolidation, not so much at the manufacturer space, but down where the Pollards live in the, in the, uh, the dealer network. And so why, you know, what's the, the real fundamental driver of all of this is the on-farm consolidation, that growers keep growing, right? They, um, and, and they have to do that for a couple of reasons. The, one is that they, um, you know, they're in, a, in an environment where land prices keep going up, input costs keep going up, but commodity prices don't. And economies of scale is extremely important um, if you're gonna survive there. So farmers need to, to be able to grow to make that work. And one reason they can is because of all the technology innovations that make them be more efficient and let them operate at greater scale. So, you know, things like new seed traits where you've got GMO products that you don't have to spray nearly as much. You don't have to have as many tillage passes. You can, then there's all the equipment uh, evolution that's happened to make them more efficient in, in how they operate. These, this allows growers to get larger. And when they get larger, they, they need a dealer network to be larger and more sophisticated as well. And so when you look at the John Deere dealer, now I'm venturing into your territory, so you jump in here if I screw this up, but you know, you've got a grower, you know, it used to be fine to just sell them a, to sell green paint, right? Farmer buys a tractor and buys a planter, he's off doing his thing. Um, but these machines now are very complicated. There's a lot of onboard computers. There's a lot of, you got to calibrate yield monitors. You have to set up your precision planting equipment right. You're, you're receiving, um, you know, you've got them connected to the cloud and receiving files and, and sending up files and all this thing. So 
not every dealer is positioned to be able to handle that. And, and the growers need somebody that can be a bigger part of their operation, not somebody that's just selling them green paint in that example. So deers forced consolidation down to those dealers that can handle that and can offer a wider uh, array of services um, in terms of really depth and, and breadth. Um, and then in the ag retail community, you've got the same thing. The, the farmers uh, are, are you know, operating more based on data and they need um, agronomists that can help with that. People that can offer precision soil sampling services and variable rate fertilizer recommendations and variable rate seeding and go out there and, and, and scout and make infield recommendations and all of these things. Um, and so that dynamics changed. It, you know, it used to be really, really about personal relationships in that regard. You got an agronomist who works for some retailer that you went to high school with in your small town. You know, that's who you're going to buy product from. But it's becoming more of a business relationship as growers get more sophisticated. They expect um, good information about product performance. They want help with planning and in-season insights. They want help with interpreting satellite imagery mid-season and all of this. So that forces a lot of those uh, low service companies out of the market. And so you've seen a lot of consolidation there in, in retail as well. And you know, as I'm saying, a lot of that is, is being driven around sophistication and, and about data and so on. And that brings it more, you know, really close to home for us. Um, and I guess I'll, I'll pivot a little bit to the journey that we've been on and kind of why we decided to sell in the end. Um, so our primary customer was these, this ag retail agronomist. And you know, companies like Helena, Nutrien, your local co-op. Um, and we were enabling them to go out and collect data and help growers make decisions. The manufacturer class, the, the Bayer, Syngenta's, all these guys really weren't engaged. They've been carrying on business the way they always had. Until 2008, kind of the light bulb went on for somebody in St. Louis at Monsanto who said, you know, this precision technology has got big implications for the future and we can't just continue doing what we've always done, which is controlling all of our own trials. All the data that we have is data that we control in our own environment and we've, we're still selling seed the way we've been selling it for 70 years, which is go plant trials out in, you know, half the counties across the country trials they control, um, they, they gather that trial information and they go to a farmer and say, hey, look at how our seed did in the trial in, this, in your county, right? And you got some farmer testimonial on it. I mean, that's been the way seed's been getting sold forever. But they realize that the way seed's gonna get sold in the future and really all inputs is it's gonna be tailored not just to a field, but to the subfield. You know, we have the geospatial boundary of that field. We know what soil types are in it. We know the slope and aspect of every meter on that field. We know when it rained, when it didn't rain. We know what was planted. We know how it performed based off the yield data we're pulling off the combine. Um, that data in aggregate provides tremendous value when you're thinking about what seed varieties you're gonna create in the future or what chemistry programs you need to create. So it changes that kind of R&D pipeline and that innovation pipeline but it also lets you provide a, a ton of insight and influence directly over the farmer. And if, you know, a Monsanto can't do that, then they're, they're in kind of a, a tough spot. And they could see that the agronomy community uh, was, was getting more and more of that direct influence. And so they, in, they did several things uh, for a number of years, but then they made a big move in 2013 where they bought a startup out of San Francisco called the Climate Corporation. And Climate is a uh, <coughs> San Francisco startup started from, uh, by some ex-Google guys who told a great story about um, data collection, 
machine learning, artificial intelligence, and, and pitch this, you know, kind of cast this vision for um, being able to, to, to do the things I was saying, really. Capture that infield data, learn from it, make field-specific recommendations, and so on. So Monsanto bought those guys for a billion dollars. Even though they were losing millions a year, they, were not a, they weren't much bigger than we were, um, but they made a big gamble and, and put a lot of money into this thing. And what that did is really awakened the whole industry. Uh, even the company, even our biggest companies in the ag retail space, their CEO didn't really know what was happening down in the field. And when Monsanto did that, and Monsanto went out and told this story, the CEOs of the Gromarks and Wilbur Ellis's and Nutrients and these guys went, whoa, okay, that, okay, this is the future. What are we doing? Oh, we're using some little company called SST in Stillwater, Oklahoma. It's owned by a couple of Okies, you know. Um, do we have that data? No, the, SST's got it. Um, what if SST sells to Monsanto? They work with Monsanto, they're probably gonna to sell to them. Then our data is in the hands of the manufacturer that helps them disintermediate us. So a lot of our customers started getting nervous um, and, and a lot of them wanted to take their destiny in their own hands so they started building their own software tools to compete with us. So that's about run its cycle now, but Wilbur Ellis, Gromart, Helena, they've all gone off and, and several others have gone off and built their own software solutions. And, you know, that put us in a position of, you know, we're already in a, a down economy and our growth hasn't been as strong as it was. Now we've got our customers competing with us. We've got not only Monsanto uh, coming to the market in a strong way, but it spurred tons of capital coming in from every venture capitalist and private equity firm you can think of and just startups coming left and right. Um, and so we felt like, wow, we've got to do something here. We're getting into a vulnerable state. So we looked at all of our options. We looked at uh, raising money from private equity firms. We looked at selling to some of the big equipment manufacturers. We talked to seed and chemical companies. And um, I mean, we had people coming at us left and right. And in the end, we decided to sell to these guys. Um, and because we fundamentally believe that there's going to be an independent data management winner, that it doesn't make sense for um, growers and agronomists and this whole market to depend on companies that, that have uh, other true motives underlying it. You know, um, Bayer is in the business to sell seed and chemicals, and that is going to be front of mind, right? Deer's there to sell hardware and you know equipment and we wanted to stay independent so we we were really attracted to the players out there that uh, companies like this that nobody's ever heard of but that do a lot with data and analytics um, so we made that decision and, and sold it in February of 2018 um, and and it has it has uh, it's had a big impact on the way we're viewed in the market right people Kind of, they, they know now that we're not going to be um, with one of the big manufacturers um, and it's put us in a strong position to, uh, to get ourselves positioned as a third party intermediary where we, we now are doing a lot where the retailer will trust us with data and their agronomic logic, the manufacturer will also trust us and work with us and we can help um, them transact business through our platform. And you know, that's a big part of our strategy going forward, to deploy tools to agronomists and farmers, um, also be working with manufacturers and, and you know, helping them facilitate business with each other on, on their terms, but in a way where um, they're not giving up data to companies that they, they may not uh, completely trust. Um, So, how much how much time do I have here, and what do I? Yeah, about ten more I'll I'll just yes go on with one other thing here that I think it, 
it helps describe some of what Dr. Norwood said earlier about um, the issue of why a lot of these mergers don't work. And when, when you look at the way innovation happens, you know, companies, when they start out, they're, they're in a little fledgling market and they've, they've got technology that's unproven and they have to iterate and it, for a long time it creates low value until they get it figured out. And then you get this huge increase in value and growth and then it kind of diminishes in value and, and levels off and grows. And you know, this is that incumbent player in any space. Um, and you know, using that Monsanto example, they're, they were here in seed. Their customers are asking them for more of the same and better. You know, they want better, faster, cheaper, but they want the same thing. And there's a really good book written by Clay Christensen in 1997 um, called The Innovator's Dilemma that describes this. And what you know, tends to happen in a market is that you, you have a whole bunch of companies you know, down here innovating this space, most of them. You know, venture capital guys will tell you nine out of 10 fail. It's usually not that bad actually, but you know, most of them fail. Um, and then, and they're in a market that is not directly competing with this. And these guys can't afford to go back and fund all these efforts. That's really not what the, the business they're in. And they're big giants who are just trying to keep driving that, you know, 8% growth for shareholders or whatever. They, and they're, they're not, they're structurally not set up to go back and do this early stage innovation. And what inevitably happens is somebody figures it out and then comes up from behind them and overtakes this. And this is what, you know, Monsanto sees as a threat of, hey, we have a tremendous amount of influence over the way seeds purchased, but we could see that, hey, somebody's going to change this game and the whole, it upends the whole thing. It's a disruptive kind of force that, that comes along and really um, changes the whole dynamic of the market. And so that's why they're, you know, not trying to create that themselves, but go place a bet on somebody that's figured part of this out and create this kind of um, change in the, the dynamics of the market. And, you know, all companies struggle with this issue and you see those companies who are trying to just do more of the same and they're, they're acquiring each other, um, but then they get disrupted by somebody coming up from underneath them. And, you know, in the John Deere world, you know, Deers here, well, they, they went and bought three, you know, paid $305 million for Blue River Technology out of California, um, who's a machine learning AI spraying robotic system that is going through a lettuce field. It, it, they teach it to know what a lettuce, field, a lettuce plant looks like, and it's using cameras and sensors and then finding everything that's not a lettuce plant and therefore a weed and spraying it with, with chemical. But they're just spraying, you know, literally this big of spot around that plant to kill it and reducing pesticide by, you know, 90 percent. And you know, those aren't there's a company like Deer can't afford to go chase everything like that, and they're not set up to do that kind of early stage innovation. But they're looking for companies like that that have the potential to disrupt them, and then they're going to go acquire those guys to try to participate in this next wave and not get displaced themselves. All right, I'll wrap it up there. And uh, yeah, you want to 